I think we will start our seminar uh, and let, first of all, I uh, apologize for uh, this unpleasant situation with uh, changing times between uh, Russia and Korea. It's my fault. I'm sorry. And it is a great pleasure today to uh, present our new speaker, Professor Kimitaki Hayasaki. And since he uh, is a speaker of our seminar for the first time, let me introduce him just a little bit. Uh, Professor Hayasaki, uh, he's uh, uh, is employed at the Department of Astronomy and Space Science uh, of uh, Chungbuk uh, National University in South Korea. And he started his active research activity in 2004 as a postdoc uh, in the Division of Applied Physics of Hokkaido University in Sapporo, Japan. And since then, he um, uh, he had several postdoc positions. Uh, he was visiting scholar somewhere, and uh, um, uh, he was a postdoc the Department of Astronomy of University of Kyoto. Uh, then he was a visiting scholar at uh, Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne, Melbourne Austra Australia. And finally, in July of 2001, he got uh, a valuable Fellowship of Korean Astrono Astronomy and Space Science Institute in the Chang in Korea. And in uh, three years, he was employed uh, at the position of uh, professor at Changbuk National University. Well, there is um, uh, he is called Black Pole Astrophysicist. Ast astrophysicist. He's um, an author of uh, about more than 40 publications, and all these publications are really remarkable because more, they are mostly published in very good journals, APJ, APJ Letters, and the last one, this one, which will be the subject of the talk in uh, Nature Astronomy. But then in many of publications, he is the only author, and in many publications, he is the first author of the uh, paper. His uh, uh, research interests are uh, astrophysics, astronomy, and astrophysics, theoretical physics, gravitation, gravitational waves, uh, uh, theory of relativity, black holes, extragalactic astronomy, uh, then uh, accretion disks, and uh, so on. And for today, uh, Professor uh, Hayasaki will give us a talk about nuclear emission from tidal destruction of uh, destruction events. Please, uh, uh, Hayasaki san. Okay. You are most uh, welcome. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, Dima, for introducing me to the, to the participants here. And also, thank you very much for inviting me to, to the, this seminar. I'm very, very happy uh, to give a talk here. All right? And can you hear me? It's no problem. Yes, I hear. Yeah. I okay. hear, but the uh, sound is a little bit too low. But nevertheless, well, I, I hear. Sounds sounds low. The voice is low. Just a moment. How about this? 
Oh yeah, it's it's okay. It's okay. Okay, good. Yeah, I think okay. it, it's good. Okay, so then title of Neutrino. Uh, this, this is uh, the title of my talk today, and my name is Kimi Take Hayasaki from Chimbuk National University. And uh, I'm uh, actually a uh, Japanese, but I'm working in uh, uh, university, uh, CBNU University in Korea. Um, okay, and then um, this is a uh, 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 scientific motivation uh, to study uh, tidal disruption events, let's say TDEs. Um, and first of all, uh, TDEs uh, uh, are good proof of quiescent supermassive black hole and inter intermediate mass black hole as well, right? And then second, TDEs are uh, known as uh, among the brightest transients over wide range of bands from optical to, to soft X-ray. And third one, uh, as you can guess, the TD is a natural laboratory for testing general relativistic effects because uh, TD is happen very close to the supermassive black holes. And finally, TD is a good candidate, or could be, or can be, uh, can be a candidate, good candidate for multi messenger astronomy, the gravitational wave emitters, and cosmic ray or neutrino sources. And I'm going to, to uh, talk about, uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on the uh, uh, final topic, uh, especially uh, uh, TDEs as neutrino sources. All right. Okay. And then this is a standard picture of TDEs. And you can see here uh, supermassive black hole. And the uh, star is uh, originally located here. And that actually uh, uh, typically uh, one, parsec, one parsec away from the supermassive black hole. And, and the star approaches to the supermassive black holes uh, from here, from here, and, and approaches to, to the uh, uh, radius, uh, this is a tidal disruption radius, and the dust to the circle line is a tidal disruption radius. And at this radius, whereas uh, the black hole tidal force uh, just overcome the self gravitating force of the star, right? And leading to the disruption, disruption of us, uh, or, or breaking up the hydrostatic balance of the star here, okay? And then after that, uh, uh, debris, uh, uh, half of the mass is bound to the black hole and half of the mass is unbound to the black hole, all right? And a typical scale, uh, tidal disruption radius here is, uh, uh, roughly uh, 25 uh, uh, shiva suit radius here, All right? Okay, just in case, uh, MBH6 for M black hole over 10 to 6 solar masses, right? Solar masses, M star, one equal uh, solar masses, Sorry. This is a stellar mass normalized by solar mass. Right? And then this is given by, as you can guess, uh, stellar radius over stellar radius over solar radius. Right? So the tidal disruption radius, is roughly, uh, let me say again, tidal disruption radius, 25 times Shibashi's radii for 10 to 6 solar masses and a solar type star. Okay. And, and there is a simple condition, very simple condition for TDEs. Uh, this is for just in case of a non-spinning 
for case for simplicity. Um, the condition for, uh, for whether condition for uh, whether TDs occur or not is given by a, given by this equality. As you can easily guess, the tidal distribution radius should be larger than Shibata Shizuto radii. So this inequality gives us a constraint on, on constraint constraint on the black hole mass to cause the tidal disruption events. And so the black hole uh, mass uh, should be smaller than 10 to 8 solar masses for a solar type star. So we call it actually a Hill's mass. Uh, but here's an exact uh, definition of, of Hill's mass. Uh, um, according to the exact definition of the Hill's mass, Hill's mass is uh, uh, very slightly lower than uh, the 10 to 8 solar masses. Okay. And from this condition, as you can guess, um, TD is likely to happen at smaller black hole. Smaller black hole means that quiescent supermassive black holes in inactive galaxy, not active galaxy, inactive galaxies, all right? And that's why uh, just, uh, for your information, uh, TD is unlikely happen to happen for M87 stars. Uh, as you can see the behind, my, behind me, the M87 stars, uh, it is unlikely for M87 stars because of uh, the black hole mass is very, very huge, 6.5 times 10 to 9 solar masses. Okay, so even the black hole is a spinning black hole. Uh, the black, uh, M87's black hole is uh, too, too huge to cause tidal disruption events. All right? Okay. So just a moment. Okay, so, so let's get back to the standard picture. Standard picture, standard picture of a uh, tidal disruption events here. And then as you can see, uh, this part, this part is uh, stellar mass has, uh, um, has a negative energy, negative specific energy, negative specific energy. That's why stellar mass is bound by the black hole and right? gravity and fall back to the black hole. Okay, and this part, this is an unbound part. That's why Stellar Stella Davis flies away from the black hole. Okay, this part. And typical, typical scale of fallback time of most tightly bound orbit. Most tightly bound orbit is 0.1 year for 10 to 6 solar masses and one solar, one solar type star. A solar, sorry, solar type star. So the next question is, what the rate of mass hole back into supermassive black hole? What is uh, mass hole uh, back Sorry, may I ask a question? Okay, please. This type of disruption, it should depend slightly on the equation of state of the star, yeah? Oh, on that's the, right. But you, do not study this. Okay, no. that, yeah, that's a good point. Because this is because uh, um, thermal energy of the star is negligibly small for uh, um, a negligibly small compared with uh, kinetic energy or binding energy, mm -hmm. kinetic energy uh, for, for, for a main sequence star, right? main sequence star. So you can you can you can easily compare the sound speed of the star yeah. uh, with the free hole velocity of the star, free hole velocity, right? So if sound speed is comparable to the, the free hole velocity, then we have to uh, we have to consider the equation of state to estimate yeah. tidal disruption radius. However, for main sequence stars. Uh, 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 as I told you, 
thermal energy is negligibly small. So that's why we don't need to take account of this uh, equation of state here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no problem, you're welcome. Thank you for your question. Okay. And so the question, so mass hole by plate. So mass hole by, hole by, hole by plate is given by this formula, this formula. So dm over dt is uh, because of the chain rule, dm over d epsilon and d epsilon over dt. And then here, uh, m is a stellar mass and uh, epsilon is, uh, or m is, a, sorry, Debris mass and epsilon is, as you can see, the Debris specific energy, which is given by the binding energy of the Debris. And uh, as I told you, the thermal energy is here is negligibly small. So that's why I neglected the thermal energy term here. So that's why Debris specific energy is written by the uh, minus GM black hole over 2A. A is a semi axis of uh, Debris orbit. Okay. And then the, it's time derivative of Debris, Debris energy is uh, time derivative and given by is proportional to the t to the, t to the minus five sub. Uh, uh, by using the Keplerian saddle because the debris orbit uh, follows the Keplerian saddle, right? Okay. So this term, this term is proportional to t to the minus five saddle, right? So next question is this term, right? This term. Whether this term dm or dp epsilon is time dependent or not. So this. This is conjecture. So this uh, this thought the dm over d epsilon is constant during the, the disruption process. So then dm over dt uh, that is to say mass over plate is proportional to t to the minus t to the minus five sub. And then the, this is a least conjecture. And then the Evans and Kochanek, uh, nineteen eighty nine. So they uh, confirmed that this conjecture is, uh, this conjecture works uh, by numerical simulations. And here you can see uh, differential mass distribution, dm over d epsilon, and normalized by stellar mass over delta epsilon. And delta epsilon, this is a tidal potential, right? Tidal potential actually. This kind of uh, just moment. I put delta epsilon here. This is a tidal potential. The first order, first over, first order term of tidal potential. GM black hole over tidal dissection radius square and stellar radius, mm -hmm. okay? And then uh, look at again, uh, look at again the, the, the figure here. Um, and also specific energy, this is epsilon. Epsilon normalized by delta epsilon. And then you can easily guess that this, the half of mass has negative energy. It means half of mass of the debris bound by the black hole and hold back to the black hole. And another half has a positive energy. So we don't care right now, the another half here. And also, um, DM, the value of DM over the epsilon here, and this, this one, this one is most tightly bound debris most tightly bound debris, right? And also this one, most loosely bound debris, bound orbit, because uh, zero, zero specific energy, zero binding energy is parabolic orbit, right? This, this is a most loosely bound orbit. 
So now you can you can know the value of dm over d epsilon. dm over d epsilon here is almost equivalent with the value of dm over d epsilon estimated at the most tightly bound orbit. It means dm over d epsilon is roughly constant over the tidal disruption process, All right? So that's why uh, this is conjectures works uh, or confirmed by the numerical, uh, numerical, numerical simulation. It's actually the SPH simulations here. Okay. And, and also, oh, okay. And let's move the, the speculation of uh, event rate of the theoretical speculation of event rate of tidal disaster events here. And uh, for simplicity, let's think about a star black hole system, uh, two body system uh, here. And a star located here and a black hole located here. And then, uh, and, and and you, uh, so stars uh, hold, hold on to the black hole. And then, so within this cone, we call this cone is Ross cone. So all the orbits, all the orbit within, within this cone finally enter into the tidal dis dis disruption radius, tidal disruption radius. Okay. So that's why. Uh, as you can see, uh, actually, this is a cross section, cross section of uh, uh, tidally uh, disrupted stars. So, event rate, event rate here, event rate simply estimated. Number density, number density is here, and multiplied by stellar velocity. Stellar velocity is here, multiplied by cross section. Cross sections here, cross sections here, right? Cross sections here. Okay. And based on this simple estimation we can get the uh, 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 event rate is 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 4 per year per year. Okay, right. excuse me, may uh, I make a comment, non, not a question, just a comment uh, on this. Uh, uh, my name is Pavel Ivanov uh, from Moscow. So, and uh, just a, a simple comment, but this, uh, this picture holds uh, only at relatively large radii uh, where uh, the lost cone uh, is so-called uh, full, uh, full of stars. That's right. Okay. Yes. Closer to black hole, uh, it is empty. Yeah, it is empty uh, because uh, just uh, stars were diffusing in um, angular momentum space due right. to two-body relaxation. Yeah, and uh, they just uh, they uh, supply rate into Los Con is not strong enough uh, to keep it uh, full of stars. Yeah. And that's why uh, actually the uh, estimates show uh, that uh, you need to calculate uh, the tidal disruption rate uh, at uh, some characteristic uh, radii where there is a transition right. between uh, full and empty, empty loss points uh, regimes. Uh, I think it's just a principal point in, uh, in the whole business. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for very, very helpful comments, Pavel. I know, I know you, and I know your name on the, the lots of papers about the TV. Yeah, I know you as well. Two thousand. Thanks for very helpful comments. Anyway, okay. 
So get back to the speculation of a 2D rays. Um, yeah, so, so by using an estimation, uh, estimation using the distribution function of the star. Uh, so this is also surprisingly the, the uh, consistent with the simple estimation. So 10 to 4, 10 to minus 4 per year or per galaxy. Okay, so this is skip and this is skip. And uh, let me summarize the uh, TD standard TD theory here. Uh, again, so this is a mass hole work rate. Uh, this is a mass hole work rate. And this is a time. So it means a mass hole work, mass hole work curve. And because a uh, simple relation um, between the luminosity and uh, M dot. So uh, this is uh, based on assumption that the uh, mass hole back rate is, uh, mass, mass hole back rate corresponds to the accretion rate. And then this shows actually the light curve, right? Light curve. So light curve shows the T to the minus five star the decay like this. And then uh, also you can see the the peak peak of m dot peak of m dot is much 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 larger than much larger than Eddington accretion rate. So it means uh, this is a super Eddington accretion, right? And then of course uh, there are some arguments against the t to the minus five side of car, five 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 side of curve uh, by, I mean, by taking account of uh, various uh, more complicated physical processes. Um, but this is a, a most simplest uh, case, most simplest theory. Um, and the peak of, because of a super, this kind of super Eddington accretion, the peak luminosity should be uh, Eddington. It's comparable to the Eddington accretion, uh, Ed sorry, Eddington luminosity. Uh, this is a 10 to 44 L per second for 10 to 6 solar masses, uh, six, six, 10 to 6 solar mass black hole. And the duration time of the tidal distraction flare, so this is uh, the correspond to, so this is, uh, uh, sorry. This is a corresponding to corresponding to here super Eddington period, right? And the effective temperature based on the assumption that the black body radiation or, or black body radiation, the effective temperature is three times ten to five Kelvin. And the event rate, as I told you, I tend to minus four to ten to minus five. Uh, per year per galaxies. Okay. And then let me summarize for TD observations here. Um, there are um, uh, roughly, so roughly 100 TD candidate suspects in posters have been identified so far. Um, the, there are two main classifications of the TDEs. One is a summer TDEs. Summer TDEs here. And, and the summer TDEs are also divided into the three categories, the soft FSA to optical UV emission TDEs and optical UV only, UV emission only TDEs and any summer emissions plus weak radio Showing with with showing weak radio, and uh, assassin fourteen LY is this type, this type, and another uh, TDE is, is a non summer, uh, let's say jetted TDE. In jetted TDE, the TDE shows uh, hard X and radio dominantly compared with the other wave band, right? And then observable event rate is 
uh, given by 10 to minus 7 per year per megaparsec cubic. So this is corresponding to 10 to minus 5, five year per galaxy. If um, number density of galaxies is 0 0.01 megaparsec cubic per uh, megaparsec cubic. This is a typical value of number density of galaxies, right? All right. And then JTTD is a three times 10 to minus 11 per year per megaparsec cubic. So that's why uh, ZTD is, is very low rate, much, much lower rate compared to non GTTD. And actually, uh, only three GTTDs uh, have been identified ever. Okay. And uh, this is a radio observations of TDEs. And this is a radio. The luminosity is here, and this is a tie. And then the G3 are actually three JTDs have been identified so far. Okay, and the remaining six is uh, smaller than 10 to 40 every per second. So this is a tentative criterion of uh, between the radio loud TD and radio quiet TD is here, right? Okay. Do you have any question or comment? No. Okay. That's good. All right. And then let's move the uh, ice cube neutron. Association between ice cube neutrino and 80 2019 DSG. So we call for simplicity from now on. From now on. Sorry. From now on, uh, just AT DSG. We call it. ATDSG, just for simplicity from now on. So I skip in the Torino ATDSG Association. All right. And just a moment. Okay. So Dima, time is no problem? Time. No, time is not a problem. No problem, okay. So uh, let me uh, summarize uh, the observed properties of ATDSG. So ATDSG is a thermal TDE uh, together with, uh, with showing a weak radio. Um, and ATDSG is, uh, was observed by ZTF 2019, as far as I know. And the red shift is 0 0.015, and it's corresponding to the 230 megaparsec from the earth. And the black hole mass is, uh, uh, looks relatively high, uh, relatively massive, the three times 10 to seven solar masses by using M sigma relation. But very recently, uh, black hole mass is re-estimated to be uh, five times 10 to six solar masses. Uh, this is also, this was also used, uh, uh, this is uh, also estimated by using M sigma relation. Okay. And then she shining brightly from optical UV to soft X-ray band with uh, relativity field emissions, as I told you, and a peak uh, peak luminosity of ATDSG is 10 to 44, more than 10 to 44 every per second. And, and, uh, luminosity, uh, luminosity ratio of X-ray luminosity 
to optical UV luminosity is 0 0.1. So it means the XL luminosity is lower than optical UV luminosity. And then radio is much more smaller than the other UV or X luminosity. And then this is important. There is no clear signature uh, of, real, of relativistic Z. It means that there is no clear signature of hard X-ray photons and gamma ray gamma rays photons. Okay. And then this is a multi wavelength observations of 80 to 80 DSG optical to uh, soft X ray wave bands. And so this is a luminosity, it's corresponding luminosity, and this is a corresponding flux. Uh, right? And then this is a time or days since discovery. And you can see the peak of optical and UV emissions here. And then uh, Ice cube neutrino is detected here. So the between the peak of optical emission and then arrival of uh, ice cube neutrino is roughly 150 days. Right? So let me summarize here the property of the ice cube neutrino. The ice cube neutrino has subpeb sub energy roughly points to PEP and beta electron volt. And the second, second one is a 150 days delay from the optical UV emission peak. And the probability being an astrophysical origin is 60%. Uh, so that's why most of uh, high energy astrophysicists or astronomers still have a reserve, uh, reserve, uh, reserve that uh, this is a uh, uh, neutrino from AT. DSG. And however, so in this paper, the temporal and spatial association with the TDE and ATDSG by using the multi wave language observations increases the probability that the two are associated. Okay. Okay. And a possible site to produce neutrinos in TDEs, uh, there are four main uh, possible sites here. And first of all, uh, real six jet and internal, internal ex external shocks produces, uh, I mean, uh, as you can see, the neutrino is usually uh, produces through the particular acceleration, right? Fermi acceleration and the shock scale, the first order Fermi acceleration and proton proton collision or photo meson uh, interaction, photo hadronic interaction gives us uh, or provide us uh, neutrinos. So the uh, relativistic jet is a uh, uh, major candidate to produce uh, neutrinos. Uh, however, in ATDSG case, as I told you, there is no clear signature of a hard X-ray and um, gamma rays, that's why a relativistic jet model is not promising, not promising, not promising at this moment, at this moment, okay? And out of flows here, and this is out of, out of flows also produces the shocks between the ambient matters, uh, but uh, the out of flows speed is roughly one tenth of the speed of light. And it's uh, really lower velocity than the, that of relativistic jet. So that's why uh, this is uh, also not promising site, but not yet rejected, not yet rejected. Okay. Not yet rejected. And this corona, this is also a good candidate to produce the neutrinos. So, uh, we need to examine the neutrino, I mean, the neutrino emission from this core. And then this is uh, uh, the disk, disk is also a uh, layer or superintendent of mat uh, can produce, uh, uh, can produce a neutrino. So uh, now I'm focusing on the, the disk, the neutrino emission from the disk. Okay. 
So there are four main uh, phases uh, in a PD disk. And this is a mass flow plate, uh, mass flow plate like that, uh, mass flow back plate. Uh. And the first phase is Debye's circularization phase. And this phase shocks by the stellar uh, stream stream collision happen. And so this is a candidate phase for both the first order Fermi acceleration and the second one, but uh, because of uh, because the first order Fermi acceleration is more dominant compared with the second one, so maybe a uh, first order Fermi acceleration can happen here. And the remaining uh, uh, three three phases uh, uh, from the accretion disk. This is a candidate for the second order Fermi acceleration. And, and before explaining the 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 detail of the Fermi acceleration, let me uh, show the stream stream collision uh, or by a TD in numerical simulation. I mean. Uh, animation by numerical simulation. Just a moment, please. Okay. Here. Can you see that? Okay, so this is this is uh, the x y planes here. This is a density map of a star and black holes here, and each axis normalized by tidal disruption radius here, and this is a tidal disruption radius, and the stars located at the starting point here, uh, and then the stars move in a tidal disrupted, and as you can see, the shocks happen here. Fast, fast self interaction. Also, shocks happen here. Right? So now you can understand the stream stream collision is a good shock site or possible site to produce a neutrino through the shock. Right? Okay. So let me briefly explain the particular acceleration mechanism here. There are two types of Fermi acceleration. Um, this is a uh, fast order in a shock um, shock case, and this is a shock front, and this is upstream, this is a downstream, and the original protons enter into the shock front is like this together with energy E, and the power protons uh, are reflecting, reflected by the MHD wave uh, in the shock like this, and then proton gain the energy from the wave and accelerated, 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 and then net gained energy, normal, net gained normalized energy is proportional to V over C, V over C here. So that means the first order, first order. V over C is first order. On the other hand, second order in a turbulent gas, uh, this is uh, the turbulent gas, like interstellar medium or accretion disk. Uh, and, and proton is entered into the here. And then MHD waves, uh, randomly reflected. So the proton can be randomly reflected in MHD wave like this, like this. And then net gain the normal and net gain the energy is proportional to V over C square. So, so this is a uh, origin of the name, the second order Fermi acceleration. 
And the tidal disruption in this case, V over C is less than 0.1. That's why second order is, you know, uh, more inefficient or app appositely speaking, the first order Fermi accelerance is more efficient compared with the second order uh, Fermi acceleration. And then this is a neutral for action by a proton proton interaction. And uh, this is uh, accelerated protons here. Um, and this is a summer proton in the intercell medium or accretion disk. And then uh, these two protons are uh, collided here and then produces uh, three types of pions, three types of pions like this. And X is any other byproducts, uh, any other byproduct, okay? But it's it not related to the neutrino production. That's why I, put, I put in an X, okay? And the pi zero, pi zero decays into the two gamma, gamma ray photons. And, and on the other hand, uh, positive pion, positive pions uh, decay into the uh, mu neutrino and um, positive muon, positive muon. And a positive muon, moreover, decay into anti mu, mu neutrino and electron neutrino too. Right? Uh, on the other hand, negative pion, negative pion decay. Uh, into the anti mu neutrino and a negative muon, and a negative muon decay into uh, mu, mu neutrino and anti electron neutrino. And this neutrino can be observed, can be observed. Right? And then the energy, most important, importantly, most important, five percent of the proton energy, original proton energy, is converted into the neutrino energy. So this is the assignment or arrangement or assignment of the energy or energy arrangement through this process. Okay. So let's get back to the four main possible phases. Four main uh, possible phases. The circularism phase, this is a short, right? Short. And this is a disk. This is a disk. Disk means a turbulent gas. Turbulent. Turbulent gas. <laughs> More than we need to say. Sure. Please go ahead. Do, do you have any comment or question? Misha, do you have any questions? Nothing? Nothing. Welcome. Okay, okay, anyway. Uh, I'm sorry. Sure. Okay. All right. And the particle acceleration for shocks actually is inefficient because because uh, in this case, lots of photons prevent uh, interact, prevent the protons interacting with MHD wave. That's why uh, first order Fermi acceleration is inefficient for uh, circularization process. And the second one, this is a super Linton, right? Look at it. Super Ellington phase also particle acceleration is inefficient because proton proton collision time scale is much, much faster than acceleration time scale. And the third one is uh, sub, -Ellington, sub Ellington phase. This is because sub Ellington phase, as you know, the uh, standard disk is well summarized, right? Well summarized. But uh, for particular acceleration, we, for particular acceleration, we need uh, non thermal protons, non thermal protons. So that's why uh, in standard disk or sub Eddington phase, not so many uh, or a few, only a few non thermal protons. So 
you know, uh, exists. So that's why uh, sub in sub eviton phase, particle acceleration is inefficient. So that's Excuse me. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, this is Pavel again. I, uh, I, I have a very stupid question. Uh, presumably, you need uh, ultra relativistic protons. I mean that uh, you have a plenty of mildly uh, relativistic protons, uh, say, viewing uh, the. Um, yeah, that's uh, right. Non -summer, non -summer space. Yeah? Yes, that's right. So, what, what typical gammas do you need for protons? Oh, the. Typical gamma, oh. so it, it, it depends on it depends on on the, on the energy energy range. Yeah, yeah, but uh, you have, uh, I mean, uh, you have energy of neutrinos, uh, which you need. I mean, okay, uh, to, okay, to, okay. So to explain to explain subpave. Sub sub neutrino, we need a Lorentz factor is 10 to 6 or 7. Ah, uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. And then question is how how we get the maximum protons energy, maximum accelerated protons energy. So all of the time scale is uh, depends on the energy as a function of energy. Protons can accelerate up to the energy at here. The at the equation balance the equation. This is the acceleration time scale, and G is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. G is eight time scales of a process to prevent the proton accelerates, right? And uh, let me briefly explain here. This is a accretion time scale because accretion prevents, you know, you can easily guess accretion easily prevents the protons accelerating. And this is a summarized time scale. So if the proton is summarized, there is a no non summer proton. We need a non summer proton to accelerate the protons. So, and then this is a cool on loss time scale because this is cooling. Cooling by Coulomb loss, then the acceleration, the Coulomb loss also prevents protons accelerating. And this is a Compton drag. Compton drag also prevents protons accelerating. And this is a division of protons. And this is a proton proton collision time scale. This is a synchrotron cooling time scale. This is a photo meson or photo hydronic uh, interaction time scale. And then in layer phase, look at here for 10 to 7 uh, solar mass black hole. And, and this is a mass accretion rate normalized by Eddington accretion rate. Small dot is defined by like this. Excuse uh, me, may I ask you a question? Equation what? A question. May I ask you a question? Yeah, please. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> if you observe neutrinos, uh, shouldn't you observe many more gamma photons uh, from the source? <clears throat> you said uh, the, you'll get uh, P zeros from uh, PP collisions and the P zeros decay into photons. And uh, presumably, you should get uh, many more <coughs> gamma events than uh, neutrino events. Is that true or not? Gamma is gamma rays, you mean? Yeah, gamma rays, of course, yes. Uh, so you mean uh, gamma rays also emitted, right? Yeah, yeah, many more gamma rays. And uh, yeah, they, okay. they are yeah. much easier to observe on Earth than uh, neutrinos. OK, so that's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, gamma rays, of course, uh, uh, produces through the uh, pi, pi zero, pi, pi zero decays. However, in a LIAC, uh, because of the pair creation, pair creation, gamma ray, it's 
uh, cannot be escaped from the liar. Oh, okay. So, so that's why uh, only neutrino uh, can be uh, productive and then escape from the liars. So gamma rays, in principle, gamma rays, of course, gamma rays produces, but uh, because of our pair creation process is very e efficient, that's why gamma ray cannot ex escape from the liar. It means gamma rays uh, is lost, right? Lots of gamma rays are lost by uh, pair creation process. Okay, I see. <clears throat> Okay, so then, so look at here again. So this is a time scale, uh, normalized by acceleration time scale here. And then cross point is a maximum, cross, cross point gives a maximum energy, maximum energy. And then in this case, diffusion. This is a diffusion. Diffusion time is more, more efficient as a cooling, cooling among other cooling time scales. Okay. So for 10 to 6, 10 to 7 solar masses, the protons are accelerated up to 10, 10, uh, 0.5 pe peta electron volt. And then Lorentz factor, uh, Pavel uh, asked me previously, uh, Lorentz factors here at the acceleration time scale is. Uh, at the uh, maximum, sorry, maximum possible proton energy uh, for a solar type star uh, and estimated the tidal disruption radius. So three points times 10 to six. And then this is a uh, accretion rate dependence and black hole mass dependence. You can see here. And then proton energy, so actual proton energy is uh, 3.1 PEV holes, three times 10 to seven solar masses. And the neutrino energy is uh, roughly, uh, you know, that 0.2 peta electron volt points. This is uh, consistent with observed one, All right? And then differential luminosity spectrum or layer phase, this is a, a proton uh, spectrum, the proton flux. And this is a neutrino flux here. And then we can estimate a neutrino horizon like this, and a neutrino flux from here. This is a, this is actually a dimension of a luminosity, but uh, okay. So this is a luminosity, right? Then and together with the ice cube flux limit, um, by combining these 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 quantities we can get a detection rate in 10 to minus four per year. It looks uh, very low, right? So let me summarize my talk. Okay, so there are four possible sites to produce neutrinos in tidal disruption events. For ATDSG case, the disk model is promising because of a non, non high, high energy X-ray gamma ray detection. Uh, although it's still retained in, in, in debate. So our points are summarized below here. And first one is high energy particle during the debris circular radiation and the super in phase are unlikely to be produced. And observed the neutrino can be produced by the wall layer model. And however, in, in our layer model, the estimated detection rate is 10 to minus four per year. It's, is uh, looks uh, very low. So that's why we needed to more discussion. We need to have a more discussion. We need to more, uh, we needed to examine as a model, for example, this corona or choked jet model uh, should be, yeah, should be uh, um, examined. That's all. Okay. And then, so finally, let's me, <laughs> let's me advertise. Advertise for a postdoctoral position to you guys all, or the student and postdoc. So, 
I'm seeking right now the three years uh, post uh, postdoctoral position at uh, at my university, uh, starting from September or earlier this year, and to work with me on the about the theory of the TDEs and uh, the other topic, uh, also welcome. And a postdoctoral position is offered up to three years, initially for two years, and for one more year after evaluation. And the salary is uh, an average level of a postdoctoral fellow of Korean Research University. And if you are interested in it, please ask me by email. And application deadline is a June salary, uh, more than two months later from now. And uh, you need a PhD in astronomy or physics at the time of appointment. And if you are interested in, uh, please ask me the detail by email. Uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Kim. Uh, it's, uh, for me, it seems to be a huge field which can be elaborated in many details. Well, there is a lot of work here which can be done uh, uh, to investigate many details, numerical simulations of the acceleration processes and so on. Well, I will, I'm amazed by this activity. Thank you very much. Well, perhaps questions, Paolo? Uh, yeah, uh, wait a second, I have a phone ring. Just... Yeah, uh, uh, apologies. Uh, I have a question uh, on transition to uh, this real state, because presumably you assume that right after super eigenform state, you have a kind of thin disk, yeah? Uh, yeah, here. And uh, what uh, exactly produces transition from, say, thin disk to uh, real, for a kind of instability, or it's, it is just assumed, do you know uh, any analysis of this transition or cut simulations? Yes, that's right. That's that's a very very good point. So we, we yeah we should uh, uh, at this moment we don't know uh, much about the transition between the how subelectron disk convert to or or transit to to the layer DR. So that's why we need to, to care about uh, more more carefully. We we need to handle this area more carefully by numerical simulation. The main point is uh, the viscous time scale is, uh, or viscous time scale between the standard disk and layer is uh, totally different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Simply, I, I'm thinking on this issue as well, myself. Thank <laughs> That's you. Okay. Yeah, but this, is a, this is a good point. Good question. Okay, more questions, comments? Well, uh, may I ask a philosophical question? Yes, please. Yeah, you mainly, well, discussed the results of uh, analytical estimates, analytical models. But I assume that uh, there can be uh, the many processes can be simulated numerically. What do you like more to do analytical job or simulations? And uh, to which well uh, extent uh, the simulations here can reproduce uh, real situations because uh, physics is very complicated, many processes, and uh, uh, well, um, well, it seems well you should consider too many cases. 
yeah, right. So okay, so 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 let me say again the, your point, your point, briefly. So your question briefly. My question is: What do you prefer to do analytical calculations or analytical estimates of the dependencies and acceleration times, emission times, and so on, or yeah. you prefer to do numerical simulations? Yes, we need to, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, we need to, to perform the numerical simulation. For example, whether, how, for example, for how second order Fermi acceleration is efficient in LIAF model, right? LIAF model here. Mm -hmm. So, so now we don't know the, the, the exact value of efficiency, efficiency of the uh, second order Fermi acceleration or first order. First order is definitely not inefficient, but uh, we don't know the efficiency of the, the second order Fermi acceleration in, uh, in the LIAF. In the lab. So, so that's why we need to perform the numerical simulation here to estimate it, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it is a huge, huge job, huge job to do Wait. numerical simulations and well complicated. E yeah, numerical simulation is, is yeah, yes, numerical simulation is more complicated, but uh, at least we can we can estimate the efficiency. Right? Efficiency means how protons collide, or, uh, as a, I mean, together with the MHD wave, and then how proton accelerated in the by using numerical simulation. Mm -hmm. And finally, we can get the, we can estimate the efficiency, the final final efficiency of the second order Fermi acceleration by using numerical simulation. This is the example. Mm -hmm. And then, as as you can as you can get, this process depends on lots of physical parameters. That's why um, we I, I cannot decide anything yet. I cannot say uh, say something robust, physically robust yet here. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. And may I ask more question? Another question, please. May I? Well, uh, for instance, if we consider neutron star mergers, um, at the final stage, uh, other processes which can produce high energy neutrinos there. Oh, so, sorry, please, please, please say again your question. Neutron star merging. Neutron star merging, yes? Yeah. Uh, can you imagine some processes or some scenarios which would be accompanied by the emission of high energy neutrinos. Yeah, of course, the neutrino margin produces uh, the shocks, right? Shocks. Uh -huh. So, and uh, if there is a shock here, there, then uh, we need to consider about the first order Fermi acceleration. And uh, if first order Fermi acceleration is efficient, then Neutrino is neutrino should be produced. Mm -hmm. neutron, neutron star merger as well. But uh, uh, we need to more carefully handle the lots of processes to to prevent protons accelerating, as I as I showed you like this here. Lots of lots of the process, physical processes to prevent protons accelerating. So these processes depends on the neutron star merger quantities, 
uh, physical parameters and quantities. That's why uh, we need to carefully, more carefully handle to, to, to them, to, to confirm whether the protons accelerating and finally produces a neutron star, uh, sorry, neutrino from the neutron star merger. So uh, it is worthwhile uh, to try uh, to detect uh, high energy neutrino signals from merging events, neutron star merging events. Mm -hmm. Ne neutron star ma merging events? Yeah. Well, uh, for instance, ice cube or well, uh, well, can new neutron star merging events produce high energy neutrinos detectable um, at present? Mm -hmm. uh, detectable? I, I don't know. So, uh, so yeah. I, I don't actually. My my answer is I don't know. I have no idea uh -huh. at this moment. At this moment, but uh, it is worth it is worth checking. It is worth checking whether neutrino merger can produce neutrinos through, for example, proton-proton uh, collision or hot hydron hadronic collision. Mm -hmm. We need to check it. But maybe the neutron star merger produces. Uh, uh, because the neutron star merger is one of the candidates, uh, short gamma ray bursts, right? Yeah. And the short gamma ray bursts uh, produces a relativistic jet, right? And if there is a relativistic jet, then uh, it's likely to, to produce the neutrinos. So yeah. I think there are some, some reference, some reference, or, or lots of reference, I don't know, what, but. But there are some reference have already published about the topic you are interested in. So thank yeah, you. I suggest reading it. Thank you. Thank you. No questions. Well, if not, uh, let us thank speaker again. Thank you very much for your well, clear talk, but I now I understand what, what a huge field are you engaged in. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for inviting me here again. Yeah. Uh, so, I was very happy to talk to you, give a talk here. And we were very happy to listen to your talk. Mm. So uh, the seminar is over. Next seminar will be next week. Uh, the speaker will be Andrei Timokhin uh, from Zelona Gora University in Poland. And he will talk about uh, uh, pulsar, pulsar mechanisms in ordinary radio pulses. Um, as far as I can understand, his talk will uh, will be close to the talk which he gave recently at the Lebedev Institute. And it will be, on, the time will be standard, 12 o'clock, and it will be announced today. So, thank you very much all the people who attended the seminar, and now, well, Goodbye, the seminar is over. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye.